Hey guys, welcome back to another virtual combined Sunday school. I hope uh, your week has been good and that you've been able to celebrate the resurrected Lord and that we gathered and when we gather together today, I pray that uh, that you are ready to hear some more good news because that's exactly what we're going to, de- uh, to do today. Uh, if you don't have your coffee, go ahead and grab it and uh, meet me back here. I'll be waiting for you when you get back. I want to open up uh, with uh, a discussion question um, and then uh, a word of prayer. Okay, so here's, here's what I want you to discuss. What good news did you hear or experience in the last week? What kind of impact did that have on your mood when you heard or experienced that piece of news? I think it, it would do us all a little bit of good to hear about the good things that God is doing in our lives uh, over the last week. So take a minute and do that. But before we do, let me pray and then you can discuss. Father, we thank you, God, so much for the opportunity that we have to be in your presence this morning and to listen to your word and to read through it, to study it, and to discuss it. I pray, Father, that the good news that we talk about today would genuinely be good news, that we would be uplifted and ready, God, to share the gospel of Christ because of what we are studying today. Uh, Father, I pray for our week. I pray for our time together. May it all be glorifying to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, I hope you had a really good time uh, discussing some of the good things that has happened over the last week. And today we are going to continue in our good news series. Uh, Last week we talked about the good news of God, specifically that God loves us and has shared that love with all of us so that we may love one another. Well, this week we're going to talk about the good news for humanity and what that means uh, in today's world and what we can do with it, right? So open your Bibles, if you have them, to Romans chapter 5. We're going to be reading verses 6 through 21, and like we did last week, we're just going to read it in sections um, so that we'll read the text, we'll explain it, and then you will have a chance uh, to uh, to discuss it amongst yourselves. So I want to start off in verses 6 through 11. Here's what Paul writes. He says, you see, at just the right time, when, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now, right off the bat, uh, I, I want to handle context because when you get to verse 6 and you hear a, 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 a transition term like you see, usually it's like therefore. And if you've ever been in one of my classes, you know that I always say when you see the word therefore, you need to know what it's there for. All right, shout out to uh, Dr. Weatherly on, on that one from Bible College. But you need to know the context of what, you're, uh, of what you're reading. And so if we look just at the first five verses of Romans, which we're not going to read here, feel free to pause if you want to, to, to read it on your own. But this is a quick summary. What we talk about in those first five verses is are, are all the things that we have because of having a faith in Christ. We we have faith, or we have peace, we have perseverance, we have hope, those, those kind of things. And that is the context in which Paul is building on in verse 6. And that's why he says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. He says you should have hope 
because at the right moment and at the right time, Christ died for all of us. And he died for us when we needed it the most. Christ died for all of the ungodly when we needed it most. And so it kind of like begs the question, was there a time? Was was there a time when Christ didn't need to die, that it would have been a waste if Christ would have died? Now, initially, we'll, we'll hear that question and we'll say, like, of course not. Well, why would that, where would there ever have been a time? Christ came, uh, could have came at any point in human history, and it would have been the right time to die because it would have saved everybody. But that's not entirely true. Now, before you throw stones at me and call me a heretic, let me just explain. There was a time, we don't know how long of a time it was, where Christ did not need to die. And that was before the fall of man, before that first sin in Genesis chapter 3. If Jesus would have came and and died in chapters 1 and 2 for the sin of the world, there would have been no sin. It would have been useless. And so we know that any time before that, or any time after that, excuse me, would have been as good of time as any, except for the fact that the right conditions needed to be met, the right, uh, the right uh, time needed to be in uh, Israel's history, needed to be the right time for Christ to have the greatest impact, not just on the future, but on those who came before. And so what Paul is saying is that, look, we have so much because of Jesus Because at the right time, he died for us. Now, now Paul Paul will get into this idea that, you know, that, yeah, okay, most of us would not die for somebody else. Uh, We might die for somebody who was good. We might. But none of us really would die for those who were bad. I mean, could you just imagine for a moment taking the place of a convicted murderer on death row? No, of course not. None of us would do that, especially if it were a stranger. But yet Christ did. See, take a look again in verse 8. I think this is a central verse of the text. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, God died for us at our worst. And he did it so that we could be saved completely. Verse 9 talks about that when, when he says that since we now have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? In other words, what, what Paul is saying is like, look, if Jesus is willing to die for you, if he's willing to allow you to be reconciled, then of course he will save you from his wrath. That's the whole point. Have you ever asked yourself, you know, if salvation is being saved, what are we being saved from? Well, Paul makes it clear we are being saved from hell. We are being saved from God's wrath on our souls. The punishment necessary for those who go against God. God took that punishment for us on the cross through Jesus Christ, so that we could be saved from that wrath and be justified. Now, there's a couple words here I, I, want, to, um, I, I want to define uh, for us so that we all know what we're talking about. In verse 7, uh, Paul uses the word righteous. Well, that word righteous simply means to be made completely right, to be made completely just in one's actions, right? Uh, it, it means no matter that you are as clean as, uh, as a baby. 
And in verse 9, he talks about that justification. And justified simply means innocent. One of the, one of the uh, ways that we learned this when I was uh, first becoming a Christian was saying justified means just as if I'd never sinned. Justified means just as if I'd never sinned. And then reconciliation, which we see in verse 10, when, when Paul says, For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? That word reconcile literally means to be restored. In other words, our relationship with God is being restored perfectly through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross and resurrection from the grave. Because reconciliation opens the door for salvation. See, when Jesus died on the cross, he was reconciling the world unto himself. He was, he was restoring the relationship that was broken between God and man. But in order for us to participate in that reconciliation, he had to open the door for us to be saved. And so by Jesus dying on the cross and reconciling, reconciling the relationship between God and man, we as humans can now be reconciled with God. And as verse 11 tells us, we boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. I, I love that word boast, right? Uh, and I don't have the Greek word for it because all I see in there is a reason to celebrate, right? I mean, it's like this reconciliation, this act of Christ on the cross, this sacrificial love that we talked about last week, has given us an opportunity to be reconciled with him. And therefore, Paul says, we should celebrate, not in what we have done, but in what he can only do. Die on the cross for the sins of the world. He, uh, he has uh, atoned us. He, ha he has been our atonement. Now, that's another fancy theological term, but let me just, let me just explain to you what that means. It simply means to be uh, reconciled, to be brought together. It means at one meant, that, that moment where we become one with God. So if we could wrap this up in this section into a nice uh, kind of bow, this one statement for the section, here's what we get. We celebrate a ton because God gave us his son. Now, I, I, I understand that that might have sounded a little cheesy. You know, it rhymes. Uh, it's my Don King uh, impression, if you will. But uh, get used to it because all the other sections are going to rhyme this morning because they help us remember some things. And if there was one thing that we needed to remember, it's the fact that our salvation should cause us to celebrate all that God has done. When is the last time that, that God's salvation and your realization for what God has done brought a smile to your face? When's the last time you, you just sat back and closed your eyes and like, man, Jesus, I, I, I love you so much. Thank you for what you have done. I am grateful. Let's just celebrate together, God, your act on the cross. So that leads to our question. The question for the section. How do you celebrate Jesus' death and resurrection? Has that changed during this time of quarantine? Now I want you to, if you need to, talk about the obvious answer of I celebrate Jesus through church. That's great. And yes, we know that's changed over the last month. But what other things do you do to celebrate Jesus? Do you go on walks? Do you, do you go running like I do? Do you, do, you take a, do you take a drive in the car? You know, do you just sit back and take a holy nap 
all right? Is that what you do? What are some things that you do to celebrate Jesus' death and resurrection? Go ahead, uh, pause the video, uh, and I'll be waiting for you when you get back. All right, welcome back. I hope you had a great discussion. Let's dive into our next section of text, verses 12 through 14. Here's what Paul writes. He says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned, to be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, Death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. Now, it's a good thing we already talked about those verses previous because that word therefore is there again, and we, uh, we need to understand the connection between the two because in the, te- in the text before, we talked about the reason to celebrate, but here... Paul really just gives us a downer. You know, he, like, he pops the bubble. He goes, hey, guys, celebrate. But wait, there's death. And Paul gives us a reality check here. And, and he says straight out of the bat, everyone, everyone experiences death. Because one man sinned, death entered the world And through the sin of everybody else after that, death continued because all have sinned. Paul says in chapters earlier, he says, all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. There is not one of us who has yet to uh, live perfectly in this world outside of Jesus Christ. But it's not just that we all experience death. Paul goes on and he says that death was reigning completely from the time of Adam to the time of Moses because nobody really knew that what they were doing was wrong. Now that's a that's a debatable topic, and a lot of things can be said about verse 13 to say that sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account when there is no law, and, and I don't think we have the time to really dive into that this morning, but let me just say that, that what Paul is getting at here is that, that death reigned unopposed as king. That's what that word reigned means. It means to be king. It means complete authority. And in case you're wondering, the time from Adam to Moses, according to some commentaries that I read, was around 2,500 years. Can you imagine a world without hope for 2,500 years? And so what do we say about this? Well, to keep it short and sweet, well, really, maybe not sweet, but at least short, what we, what we say is that death's reign caused tremendous pain. Told you I'd keep rhyming. Death's reign caused tremendous pain. So think about that as you ask yourself these two questions. Number one, Paul goes from celebration to mourning pretty quickly. Why do you think he offers a reality check at this point in our text. Why does Paul go from celebration to mourning? Talk about that. And number two, Paul tells us, uh, tells us that without God's salvation, death reigns. Does death reign today? And if so, what does that look like? Is it, is it, is it just as it was during the time of Adam and Mo, between Adam and Moses? Or does it look differently today? In other words, what does a life without God's salvation look like? Even if it is perceived. Because we know that God's salvation is reality. But there are a lot of people who don't accept that reality. So what does a life without that reality look like in today's world? Go ahead and discuss that. Take as much time as you need, and I will be waiting here for you when you get back. 
I hope that discussion didn't uh, bum you out too, too much there, uh, but don't worry, there's still some hope to have. This is uh, a, a, a lesson on good news, so you know it's coming. Let's dive in, verses 15 through 19. Let's continue on. Uh, verse 15, here's what it says. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people." For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Paul starts this off by telling us that one man's sin uh, equated to deserved death for all. Not that uh, Adam ruined it for the rest of us, in, in a way he did, but he opened the door for us to sin Uh, in a lot of ways, worse than what he did. But Paul doesn't leave us with hopelessness. He tells us that God's sacrifice, however, equated to undeserved grace for all. Now, that's somewhat of an oxymoron there, but let me, let me tell you, uh, in case you don't know, what the word grace means. I love this word. Biblically, theologically speaking, when we talk about grace, we're talking about getting what you don't deserve. So, for instance, let's say you're a kid and uh, you know, you, you were a rotten kid that day. You broke a statue of your mom's. I'm not speaking from experience, but let's just say hypothetically it happened. And at the dinner table, you, 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 you finish your food. And, and then you start to get up because you know that you're, you know, that you got punished today. So no dessert. And your mom says, ah, sit down. Sit down and have some dessert. Now, you know you don't deserve that dessert, but what are you going to do? You're going to eat that dessert, right? Well, that's your mom showing grace to you. And God does the same thing even better. He says, I know that you have sinned against me, and I know that you deserve death, but I am going to show you grace, and I'm going to take that death for you, and I am going to uh, give you in exchange eternal life. Eternal life is the dessert of our salvation. And, and, and death is nothing more than a disease vector. That's an overwhelming gift, isn't it? Paul says in verse 16, The gift of God cannot be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. Death came as a result of one sin, but salvation came despite numerous sins. There is no better example of this than the Old Testament because when you, when you read the story of Israel, what you'll see are a bunch of people who will cry out to God when they need him and then when after they get saved or after they get rescued from whatever trouble they're in, they go right back around to, uh, to sinning and, and the next time they're worse than the, uh, than the time before. And yet despite all of that, God comes back. God comes answers the call. God saves them from themselves, and he does the same thing with you and me. Despite our sins, 
despite my screw ups, despite all the things that are wrong with all of us, God showed his love that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And so if that is true, and if it's true that death reigned after one sin, after one sin, death reigned, how much more, Paul says, will righteousness reign because of the gift of God? Because righteousness gives justification in life for all people. You see, God sacrificed for everyone in the world, and that sacrifice is an overwhelming gift to humanity. Are you getting the good news now, right? And death has been defeated because of that. And Christ and his, resur- and his righteousness is now reigning in its place. And that righteousness that Christ offers gives us innocence, declares us not guilty, throws away the, uh, the court records, erases it from our permanent record so that we may have life. And not just, not just for a moment, but for all eternity. And not just for the people who, who have their lives together, but for the least of these, for the drug addict, for the, uh, the homeless person, for the, for the people with mental health issues, for the people uh, who just are completely immoral. That, by the way, was a random list and not one connected with the other. But all these, all these problems that we find ourselves in, none of it matters when it comes to whether or not we are uh, able to come to God and receive salvation and the justification of our sins so that we may have eternal life. Doesn't that kind of just lift you up? Knowing that no matter what you can, uh, can do, no matter what you have done, that there is never a time, that there is never a reason when God's love will not cover your sin. There will never be a time where salvation will be taken from your grasp. There will never be a time when God doesn't look at you and say, you repent and come into the kingdom, my child whom I love. That lifts me up and I hope it lifts you up and so we say this yet another rhyme prepare yourselves mentally for it we have lift because of god's gift we have lift because of god's gift now as you think about that ask yourself this question we have two of them Number one, Paul talks about the chain reaction that sin has in our lives. Talk about a time when something you did, uh, when you did something wrong, excuse me, and had a chain reaction with those around you. And after you discuss that, uh, discuss this. Paul also talks about the more powerful chain reaction that Christ and his righteousness has in our own lives. So talk about a time then when you were able to show Christ's love to someone and how that caused a positive chain reaction. Did you show it through service? Did you show it through encouragement? Did you show it through speaking the word of God into somebody's life? How did you show it? Talk about that. Discuss both of those questions and uh, I'll be waiting for you when you get back. Our last verse, our last section, uh, is found starting in verse 20 to the rest of the chapter. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Now, this is a short section, but let me tell you, it says a lot. And, and, and it's, it doesn't beat around the bush either. Uh, verse 20 says, uh, says plainly, we are evil people. We are truly evil. That when it comes down to it, within our very nature, we cannot be good. We will screw up. We will sin against God. And the law was brought to prove that to us. You see, between the times of Adam and Moses, people just did what people wanted to do. Think of the Tower of Babel. And they didn't care if it sinned against God or not because there was no law, there was no rule, there was no standard. But when God brought the law, he brought a standard. And that standard, if you've ever read the law, is incredibly hard to measure up to. That was the point. The point was to prove to people that you cannot save yourselves. You need God. And so Paul says if one way it sh- the law shows us that we are truly evil, then in the other way the law also shows us how gracious and how good God really is. Yes, we are evil people. And that might sound like bad news, but it's not because God is good. God is gracious. And as we talked about last week, he loves us. So Paul says that when you compare apples to oranges, you should go for the goodness of God. We should reject the evil within ourselves for the goodness of God. We should reject ourselves, you know, uh, carry our cross, sacrifice ourselves through Jesus Christ so that we may have righteousness. We should reject death as our king and put Jesus in his rightful place. Because as we wrap this section up, we say to ourselves, and we we say it with rhyming, God's grace brings us to the perfect place. God's grace brings us to the perfect place. And that perfect place, as Paul wraps up the chapter, is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Because those who accept God's grace accept eternal life with Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, there's no better news than that. Final questions before we wrap up. Uh, question uh, number six, God is far better than anyone, including ourselves. What qualities of God make you grateful? And then after you answer that, answer this. Those who accept God's grace gain eternal life. What do you look forward to the most when it comes to eternity? I, I, I think in all these stressful times, it's good for us to uh, think about the hope that God's salvation brings. So talk about those two things Uh, discuss that, uh, take as much time as you need, and as always, I will be waiting here for you when you get back. All right, I hope you've really had some uplifting discussion there with that last question. Uh, Let's quickly um, go over our our summary sections, our sections, uh, those one statements that we uh, talked about earlier, just to refresh our memories, and because I like to rhyme. All right, here we go. Here's the four things that we learned. Number one, we celebrate a ton because God gave us his son. Number two, death's reign caused tremendous pain. Number three, we have lift because of God's gift. And number four, God's grace brings us to the perfect place. God's grace brings us to the perfect place. Now, I always like to give you one thing to just to hook on to for the rest of your day, to, to consider, to think about, to pray about, and to discuss. And today is no different. And yes, 
it does rhyme. Help me. I, 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 have, I have a sickness, I think. But here, here it is. Death is defeated because Christ has succeeded. Death is defeated because Christ has succeeded. So what do we do with this? There are three things I think we should do, and I'm going to say these very quickly. Uh, well, actually, one thing. We have to celebrate. We can't forget about what Paul says at the very beginning. We have to celebrate all of the good news that we have because we deserved death, and yet Jesus Christ gave us life. So how do we celebrate Well, I see it two ways. I see that we share our joy with others. We invite other people to the party. I mean, come on. There's no greater party than a Jesus party, right? You know, we we have to uh, invite as many people as we can to celebrate the good news of Jesus Christ. And we also have to serve those who refuse. We have to serve in, in the love of Christ to people who need it the most and people who don't think they need it the most. If we can do those two things, I think we can bring people into the kingdom and into this party that we get to celebrate with Jesus Christ for the rest of eternity. Man, I really hope you have a good week this week, and I hope that the good news of Jesus Christ, uh, the good news of God for all of humanity, I pray that that would resonate within your heart this week. (laughs) I miss you guys so much. I I love all of you. If you need anything at all, if you need prayer or questions or you want to discuss something, send me an email, larry at cornerstonerock.org. If you're interested in our church, you can go to cornerstonerock.org, our website, or you can go to our YouTube channel for more videos or even our Facebook page. We put a lot of stuff out there as well. Uh, I hope you have a great week. Peace love and soul.